Good afternoon. My name is Florence Renee, VP of Publicity and Sponsorship. We have the LA chapter with us, the Los Angeles chapter with us on this call. So this evening is a multi-chapter event. We, as far as Central Illinois, we have other chapter leaders here. We have Julie Kaiser, VP of Education. We have John Sanders, VP of Operation. I'm not sure if any chapter leaders from LA is on the call so far, but we, I guess in the interest of time, I wanna go through my announcement, my rolling deck of announcement. Um, it, it's not long, it's maybe two, two minutes long. So you all know what we have going on in the Central Illinois chapter. Definitely show your face if you don't mind. Uh, we love to see faces and Kevin is uh, excited to be here. Um, he's uh, very uh, sorry that he couldn't make the original date of February 21st, but we're here tonight and we're hoping to have a wonderful time going over best practices for projects and programs. And he will draw from his 27 uh, year career um, across many industries to kind of help us um, with that task. Kevin, if you don't mind, I would like to kick it to you. Okay. So you can start presenting. Um, where is my thingy? Oh. Can you all see my screen? Is that you? Yes, yes. Outstanding. Yep. Okay, so uh, so I'd like to echo one quick thing. Look, uh, I know that we're all working from home. We're doing a bunch of great stuff. If you all could do me a big favor, uh, one of the ways that I make sure that I'm being an effective presenter is by looking at uh, at folks' faces, right? And then seeing their nonverbal feedback. So I greatly appreciate it if uh, you could turn your cameras on. If I look away, it's not because I'm distracted. I've got my presentation over here. I've got the, the screen share in the center and um, and the chat room over here on the on my other screen. So I can see if you're asking questions. And please, I want to facilitate a professional conversation amongst us fellow professionals of the project management community. Um, so throw them in the chat, raise your hands, uh, and we're going to have some dedicated question and answer time at the end. The, the one big piece that, um, that I'd like to, uh, to add though, is that if you've got questions about some of the content that's going on, uh, and that we're gonna cover some project and program management basics up front, let's keep the questions on, on the content that's relevant to those slides. And then I'm gonna go over how I've used um, and some lessons that I've learned and some best practices that I've either developed or people have shared with me in putting all this stuff together. Uh, first and foremost, this is a disclaimer. Uh, I've, I've worked for the United States Army. I was stationed with the United States Army Corps of Engineers during my 21 year Army career. I've worked for large employers like KPMG as a consultant, but everything that I'm showing you is, uh, and I work for a different firm now, everything I'm gonna share with you are my opinions and they don't reflect any past or current opinions from any of those organizations. Okay, we're gonna talk about references. I'm gonna explain quickly why what's what certifies me why why do I get the great benefit to stand up here and and facilitate a professional conversation with you all uh, why is it why is this project and program management business so important what's the relationship look like we'll talk a little bit about project life cycle domains and components and the same thing at the program level and then we're going to talk about people processes tools framework and my lessons learned you know which is a way amongst many to do that stuff uh, here's a reference slide. Here's some of the references, not just the standard for program management fourth edition and the latest PMBOK, but um, uh, but also some other pieces uh, that I've pulled from to help prepare this presentation and schedule my thoughts. So what 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 authorizes me or what gives me any kind of credence to sit up here? My academic uh, education started at Marquette University, where I learned the basics of project management uh, and as an undergraduate uh, engineering student, mechanical engineering. That was furthered years later um, with a, a degree, uh, Master's of Science in Management with a uh, in the project management track from the University of Maryland. 
uh, as an engineer officer, we learned a lot of project management in two different stints uh, at the engineer school, at the US Army Engineer School, and then learned some higher level program management and organizational level leadership at the Command and General Staff College. Along the way, I picked up my PMP, my PGMP, um, and got to serve with some really outstanding folks as a servant leader, both in the service and afterwards. Okay, why is this important? Well, one of the things that I realized, or a few of the things I realized as I was going after my PGMP uh, credential are that uh, I thought I understood program management and, and what it was, and I realized I really didn't. Um, I realized the importance of governance and, and, it, it, and how we can leverage it for decision-making and how so many organizations that I've worked in really didn't. Um, stakeholder engagement versus stakeholder management, okay? And then, and then delivery and how they're all related. Uh, we probably have seen this uh, several times through our, our, our shared careers, but poor governance often resulted from poor decision-making support systems. And we'll go over those in greater detail. That often produced poor project selection, which then resulted in an under-realized strategy or strategy attainment or, or meeting our strategic goals and objectives. Um, and then ultimately how we can optimize our project selection and delivery through uh, a careful analysis of the relationship between projects and programs uh, and the activities and the elements or domains of program management. So we know, right, the triple constraint, scope, schedule, and budget. That's, uh, that was right out of the PMBOK version uh, that, uh, that I had to take the, the, the PMP exam on. But um, I really think that uh, it really is scope, schedule, budget, and project risk. And if this were a graphic representation, the sides were of the importance of each, the thing that I have learned, and I would, I would posit with you as a practice, is that those sides change uh, based on your organization and based on uh, the place in that project life cycle you are. At some point in time, project risk might not be as important as project budget or schedule or scope, and at other times, uh, depending on your situation, you know, scope might be a little bit more flexible, but schedule can. So schedule can flex larger or smaller or budget, et cetera. But I, what I've learned is that if you, if you think about project risk like that and you phrase all of your project risks uh, with and project uncertainty, so the things that could happen uh, that benefit you from a scope, budget, or schedule standpoint, uh, it can help streamline your efforts right, and get people focused, okay? So one of my best practices, think of project risk as a project constraint, not just add that to scope, schedule, and budget. With uh, program management, right out of the, uh, the standard for program management, um, uh, and a gentleman, two gentlemen that, that wrote a prep book uh, whose names escape me right now, but they talked about the triple constraint of program management was benefit management, governance management and stakeholder engagement with strategic alignment in the center, right? We under, we take or we undertake programs so we can achieve strategic goals and objectives. And then the projects are the tools or methods uh, which, with which we, we achieve those strategic objectives, both in the collective and in the individual. Um, but I'd submit to you that if we take that and we turn it a little bit and we say, hey, this is really a trapezoid with programmatic risk, okay, uh, inside of that triple or quadruple constraint, then that can help us, we think, uh, or I think, and I'd posit to everyone, um, have a fuller and more robust um, methodology, okay, uh, for balancing the quintuple here uh, and putting things in a program management risk based on what's the risk to our strategic objectives or attaining our strategic objectives? What are the risks to effective decision making and governance? What are the risks to how we're going to engage or our effectiveness in engaging stakeholders and our benefit delivery? And I'll 
I'll take a pause right there. And I really appreciate the folks that have turned your, uh, that have turned your cameras on. Um, what, uh, what questions do we have so far? You know, raise your hand, come off a of mute or throw something in the chat, please. Bobby, thanks, buddy. Common challenge these Bobby's seen is especially with this project after the project is done, operations and maintenance, there's no ownership. No, yeah. So, we're, Bobby, I want you to hold on to that, right? Because that we talk, we're going to talk about project level uh, closeout and transition. And we're going to talk about program closeout and transition here in a second, right? And how we we take ownership. But, but I'd submit to you that and if a project or a group, if a program is a group of projects that are related based on our efforts to achieve strategic objectives in our programmatic planning we have to understand uh, we're going to uh, we're going to expend resources to do something and every project is going to close out and it's either going to go away or it's going to be transitioned okay to uh, to someone, to operations. And we've got to identify that up front and make sure the owners, right, the ultimate owners understand that and they have bought in. Great point there. Um, but what does a program really look like? A program really looks like a whole bunch of trapezoids, okay, of those projects that are in there, okay? So just, uh, you know, a, a way to think about, and guess what? They're not all the same size. They're not all aligned the same way. But uh, they each one of them, sometimes by themselves and sometimes together, help us uh, or help us deliver or, or realize certain benefits or values from their efforts. And, and what are we talking about benefits and values? Hey, that project, right, has a specific start, a specific end. It's got a specific scope that either is going to give us an outcome, so maybe an ability for our firm to do something, or an output right, a product, a specific product of some point, uh, whether that's uh, something from manufacturing like an engine or a car, uh, an outcome potentially is market share uh, or, or reputation or brand. Okay, so onto the program domains, life cycles and activities. So this is the life cycle of a program. It starts, it's three cycles, program definition, Program execution and program closure. Program definition has got two subphases. That's formulation and planning. Execution's got uh, component authorization and planning, and then component oversight and integration. How do we oversee the components or projects, sub programs or other activities, and how do we integrate them? And then after we've executed those projects or components, right? How do we transition and close those out? And then finally, program closure. And what lives throughout the entire life cycle, but our ability to manage the benefits, engage the stakeholders, um, manage the governance, and achieve strategic alignment. So while I'm not doing any, um, uh, this is a professional conversation, like I said, while I'm not doing any knowledge checks, has anyone seen stakeholder engagement before, or are we more familiar with stakeholder management? management. Thank you. Uh, uh, oh, was that Tanasha? That's Tanasha, yes. Yeah, thank you so much, Tanasha. So my question to you is, why do you think the standard for program management might, might call it stakeholder engagement versus uh, stakeholder management? I'm, I'm assuming it's more on the lines of um, ensuring that not that um, you're managing the stakeholders per se and making them do anything, but making sure that they're involved and that there's activity, interaction, and communication as far as engagement is concerned. Not necessarily. That's a, that's a great take. A anybody else want to pause it? Miss Lorena, who's been so kind to turn her camera on, any ideas? Well, I, I agree um, with what um, the other woman said. Um, it's um, the difference, well, at least the way I, I see it, because I usually do most in my, you know, I'm part of the teams, but I am usually the one that 
manages a stakeholder. I mean, engages, analyzes, engage them, and then uh, manages them. So engagement for me is is that way of keep them uh, in the loop, you know, in the larger picture, because we all want to achieve that, uh, you know, the 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 greater you know uh, right. objective output input whatever no yeah so but it's not yet they are not actually involved actively in each phase of the project and delivering deliverables or anything like that right thank you so much for that both thank you both uh tanasha and lorena you know uh and the reason why I ask is because I know that I'm with dedicated professionals and I know that you all are going to teach me a lot more than I'm going to share with you guys tonight. Um, when I think of stakeholder engagement, right, a stakeholder is anyone that even thinks that could they could be impacted by what we're trying to do, both positively and negatively. So I think of it like I'm on a ship that's about to sink and there's a great white shark that's in the water. Am I gonna manage a great white shark? No. -uh. Okay, if you've got someone with high power and low support, we're gonna go over that in a second, the best you can hope to do is engage them on your terms and maybe mitigate them, but manage that great white shark? Not me, I don't have that, I don't have that kind of horsepower, right? So that's a, just a way to think about that. Um, maybe third behind the fabulous explanations that we got from our two peers, so thank you very much. Okay, so big piece here, understand what the domain interactions look like because there are 10 activities that happen within the life cycle of the program, right? So a second ago, we said, hey, look, there's, there are these domains, but these are the 10 activities that help us get through the domains, right? Communication, change, finance, financial management, information management, Procurement, quality, risk, resources, scope, and schedule. CCFIPQRRSS. That's uh, the little palindrome thing that I use to memorize those to take the test. Um, and what are we looking at in program definition? Well, in formulation, uh, this is some of our initial planning. We're going to do our activity level assessments, okay, specifically for comms and finance, procurement, quality, risk, resources, all these pieces here. We're going to develop our business case, our program charter, our high-level roadmap, and initial risk assessment. When we, when we go through a particular phase gate or milestone, getting uh, the business case and program charter approved within our organizations, then we move on to planning, and then we develop robust planning activities. There's one for each one of those. A benefits management plan, a stakeholder engagement plan, and a governance plan, high-level plans. Okay, uh, we also know that within the program transition, more on execution in a second, program transition, we know we've got to develop, we're going to execute our financial closure. So we're going to tap into that financial management plan. We're going to execute our information closure. Whoops. So we're going to, you know, execute that plan or the final portions of that plan. The same for procurement. What did we make or buy, right? How are we going to turn that off? And then our risk and our resource transition, right? We're going to kiss those folks back that had worked on the different pieces. So understanding the integration of the plan and then remembering, and I believe that it was uh, President Eisenhower when he was a general in the United States Army during World War II, uh, that he said something to the effect of, the plan is nothing but planning is everything. Okay, so this big slug of execution, program execution, right? This is everything from waterfall to agile and hybrid, right? When I studied for and took the PMP, everything was waterfall in the PEMBA, right? And in the engineering and construction world, everything was waterfall. And, and only folks that were working on software were worried about agile. But that's not today. That hasn't been that way for a long time, at least 10 years. Uh, even in the construction and engineering and design industry, even in design bid build, we are more and more using some of the techniques that, uh, that were known and in, in agile. Uh, one of the things that we'd say at, at KPMG is we're not doing waterfall or agile, we're doing agile fall or water job, right? So um, I'm curious though for, for you fellow professionals, uh, 
what world or arena do you live in? Are you guys live in the in the big blue of hybrid, or you live in in waterfall or agile pier? I can go. I think my team is in the hybrid space, but we we like to think we're agile. Uh -huh, we're right. more, yeah, we're more hybrid than right. anything. Yeah. Thank thank you for that. Yeah. Ah, uh, Bobby, can ban Gile. I like that. Yeah. Hybrid. <laughs> living in the yeah. hybrid, right? Everybody wants to say they're agile because it's new, it's fresh, it's exciting, right? You know, in process improvement, everybody says, I'm going to do a rapid improving event, but that comes with certain strings. And when they find out what those strings are, they're like, oh yeah, no, we're, we're, we're not going to do all that, right? Um, but, but we know in Waterfall, hey, we're going to, uh, we're going to do those five end-to-end -end steps, right? for a project and that's going to take us you know from introduction through planning to execution and management and control through closure and that's it and in agile well wait a second we've got we've got sprint, you know we've got the initial lay down of the features we want and that prioritization and we're going to do sprint planning and we're going to do our sprint windows and then we're going to do our retrospectives sounds a lot like gathering lessons learned and then we're going to improve for the next round and we do a couple of those sprint windows and we put those together in an epic and and then at some point in time we're, we're done and we're going to box that up and and it sounds kind of like you know transition and closure right so i think that you know there's this is a way maybe a little bit of combination of of pmi and and other agile techniques um but a way to think about that and you know i think I think that this framework is viable for both the programmatic frame and life cycle is, is viable for both waterfall hub, uh, hybrid and agile projects. Um, and your program could be a hybrid of waterfall projects and agile projects and hybrid projects if they're all helping you and they're all related in the same in a particular way to help you achieve some strategic objectives. And I'm, I'm curious what other folks think about that. Felix, what do you think? Anyone? I'm the Smoot Holly Tariff Bill. Anyone? So, go ahead, Felix, please. Oh, I'm. I'm. To be honest, I'm not sure. Like, I'm. I'm very. I don't know. Let me think about it. <laughs> okay, I'll come back to you. Thanks. Appreciate. I, I do appreciate you coming off mute. Tim, Rick, Jeanette, Randall, anybody? Kathy? Bobby has a comment. Okay. The grace we afford each other, heightened communications and less on written comms, more frequent calls in a non-co-located team, not truly command and control type leading teams. Those are more important to him. Got it. Appreciate that, Bob. All right, continuing to move. Okay, the governance domain, decision making at its potential finest, right? So what I found that uh, what's really key is if you tie your decisions to uh, and your actions to your strategic objectives, where do you do that across all ten of your activities using your planning documents? How, you know, what do you do? Well, you use your analysis from your current and relevant measures, your current. ROIs and, and KPIs, your current return on investment and your current KPIs to measure yourself. The result could potentially be or, or assist you uh, in developing recommendations that are more time, you know, that, that facilitate a more timely decision making effort or standard. And, and, how, and what's important to that? Well, you have to understand the right standards, the right resources, the sequencing of your activities and the resources that those sequences will need. And then the fact that quite frankly, in your governance, you are approving, one of the things you do is approve resources. And by approving those resources at a particular time, you're authorizing that activity or that project to start, to pause and to stop. What, based on your updated assessments of your return on the investment, we're investing so much, are we getting the returns that we're starting to see as this particular project been overcome by events as this particular project given us all the production we hope to get. If we gotten all the water out of this stone we're going to get, 
well, then it's time to stop squeezing this one and go on to squeezing others. Okay. So I think that from a governance perspective, right, this is a way to look at these things. And, and this governance portion, quite frankly, can help you if you use KPIs and your data collection and how you neck in data down to information and then and analyze that information to make recommendations through your governance method and then looking at the people, the processes and the tools that you do or that you employ for that effort uh, can help you significantly. Let me pose a question. How many folks have seen decisions made on which projects are going to be resourced based on uh, the level that a particular champion uh, is in an organization? The higher up the pyramid, oh well, we've got to, we've got to, you know, we've got to support that because the boss wants that, or the loudest person in the room. How many folks have seen have seen that happen? Right. Thanks. Yeah, uh, me too. Right. Um, Bobby's got another com comment for us. Appreciate that, Bobby. Um, yeah, have seen that too. How many people have seen, oh, well, we have to, we have to resource this project because we resourced the last two. And, and if we resource the next three, then we'll finally get some, some production out of it. How many folks have seen that? Yeah, right. It's we get this self-fulfilling prophecy, but the first class that I took in my master's degree, you know, which talked about the basics of business, talked about you don't ever use previous, right, uh, 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 previous investments as the primary and sole decision maker for your future investments, right? It's an estimate of how close are you to achieving your objectives, your returns, in this case, the benefits that we've laid out in our strategic objectives. Um, we talked about KPIs, right? It's important to understand what are the metric categories and type. We've got business of finance, you know, the business or financial metrics. We've got the success-based metrics, the project-based metrics, the project uh, management process metrics, right? These are pretty hardcore mathematical ones, ROI, net present value, payback periods, right? Improved efficiencies, you know, some things that are really quantifiable, okay? Uh, still quantifiable here in our success-based ones, but maybe, you know, going from the benefits, you know, the number of benefits we've achieved to the value and the goals and milestones to uh, a little bit, but not quite squishier user satisfaction, right? Okay, project management still really quantifiable here. Up top, what's our time, our cost, our, our scope, or our number of changes that we've made? Our rate of requirement changes. How many how many times are we seeing changes come in? Right, uh, quality gets a little squishy because that can be both quantitative or qualitative. Right, how close are we to meeting the quality standards that we set? Right, what are our safety considerations? What what's our risk portfolio look like? And are we starting to creep to this is just not worth us to do? Okay, all the way to project manage or sorry project management process metrics. Hey, what kind of continuous improvement are we achieving? What's our benchmarking look like? Our estimate accuracy, et cetera, okay? So, right, those direct measures a la dollars, hey, those represent the business data to one or more dimensions often time. Cash is king. Any questions on this? Has anybody ever thought about it like the, this way before? Endless metrics, okay, a million metrics, but really only a few key, uh, key performance indicators, right? Cost variance, schedule variance, cost performance, and schedule performance index, okay, our utilization ones. What is our utilization? What's our number of understaffed hours? What's our cost for overtime labor? Okay, how much are we getting done during the regular workday and how much are we having to pay premium on? What's our planning cost as a percentage of the labor? How many milestones are we missing? Okay, what's our percentage? What's the percentage of the assumptions that have changed? And a little bit on assumptions for a quick second. You know, during your planning activity, you should have a lot of assumptions and an assumption is a item that you have a strong confidence will be true and you work throughout the, the life cycle of your project and program to confirm or deny that assumption, right? I, I believe tomorrow that the sun will come up. Now, 
that that's probably a ter that's a terrible example. Okay, I'm I'm assuming that I will get through all 40 slides within time. Okay, I'm about four minutes behind schedule right now, but I think I can make that up. Uh, I've got a strong assumption in about five minutes. I'm going to know whether or not, in fact, I'm not going to get through all these slides and I'll have to short short circuits. Right. So that's an example of the assumption and then confirming or denying that assumption. Okay, we see here, metrics are tied to a target. Don't have metrics just to count a thing. Don't collect data to just count a thing. Understand what your uh, key performance indicators are, collect that data so you're directly tied to it. How many folks have, have been stuck into just collecting inf data, not, not relevant information, but collecting data because that's the way we do it, or because somebody asked a question one time, when I say somebody, I mean a leader or an executive, asked a question during a board meeting, and now we're collecting this data, but it actually never fulfills any purpose or the specific purpose of decision-making and governance. You guys can throw something in the chat. Who's, who's lived through that lovely scenario before? Yes, I know I have. Otherwise I wouldn't share with y'all tonight. Okay. I have a... Sorry, Kevin, I have a quick, this is Felix. I have a quick question about that, yes. about collecting data. What if you don't know if that, what if you're just collecting data to see if it's useful data and then reevaluating later? Is that okay in, in some ways or does that, what is your take on about that? Because yeah. if we have no data, we don't know whether the data is good or bad. How can we tell if the KPR and metric is gonna be good or bad? Oh, okay, G great point. I, I think of it through good, better, best. Right? Is, is that a good process? Yeah, it's good. I won't knock that because there are a bunch of variables that go in there. But I suggest your best situation is if you say, uh, uh, one of my strategic goals is to own market share. Okay. And then you look at, so how will I know if I, own, you know, if I improve my market share by 20%? Well, you do your market research against the other players within the market. And you know what your production capacity looks like. You know that you know you've got uh, more more production capacity than you're actually utilizing because your production capacity is at a million, but your sales are only at eight hundred thousand. And you know that if you take market share away from somebody else, then you could sell those last two hundred thousand. So a a metric that might be relative to you or a, a piece of data to count is how many more widgets am I selling above eight hundred thousand? Right, because then you've got a direct indicator of potentially of am I am I taking greater market share? I hope that helps. But the idea is that you had a purpose behind developing a data collection plan to it, as opposed to just collecting that data because I might use it in the future. If you've got nothing else, then you might as well collect that data. But the, the challenge you then have is that I've seen is that people will take that data, they will conduct analysis, or they'll, they'll take that data, they'll knock it down to relevant information, they'll conduct that analysis, and then they will try to back in to the decision or the recommendation with that data. And I've seen it many, many times where that data is completely irrelevant to that decision. But they will try to back in and justify a particular decision based on the data they have rather than the data that they actually needed. Nothing's worse than the wrong questions. Yes, because then that points you in a different direction or, or a direction that's not relevant. Okay, so bonus KPBs, right? Determine your targets and decision points before you start executing so you don't do a self-fulfilling prophecy and back in. And then think about the financial and non, you know, benefits are financial and non-financial. They're internal and external. We want to be able to do this. We want to have a brand, and they're both quantitative and qualitative. Okay. So you got six variables going on. Okay. Governance tools, right? We talk about decision, decision making, understanding decision makers from those stakeholders, ID and analysis. We're going to go over that in a little bit. We've got decision criteria, right? Those key uh, performance indicators that are both financial and non financial. We've got the internal and the external, the quantifiable and non-quantifiable, and tools. How are we collecting this data? How are we 
and how are we selecting the information, necking the data down to information? How are we doing the analysis? How are we communicating that? Excuse me, what's our audience, right? We've got multiple audiences. Is it decks? Is it point papers? Is it dashboards? Is it executive summaries? Is it all of the above? More on that. Okay, so benefits management and the value proposition is that we look at value propositions through financial and non-financial internal external goals and results. Um, it doesn't matter what we wanted to achieve. Quite frankly, we are the folks that help quantify and tell the story to business leaders of what we did achieve and why we want to either resource particular projects within the program lifecycle or not. Okay, I apologize for the small pieces here, but if we're looking at the elements or activities that happen within benefits management, right? We've got benefits identification, then the analysis and planning, then the delivery of those benefits, and then how we transition those benefits over to the organization, okay? And then how we sustain those after we've closed out the components. Because remember, the project is going to close out during the program delivery portion of the life cycle and we will continue to, to uh, receive benefits, some of those benefits for a long time afterwards. And you guys can read a lot faster than I can talk, so I'll let you look at the purpose and the how and the output, and you're gonna get uh, copies of these slides in a PDF uh, after, after this brief. Okay, looking at the benefits identification, why do we do that? To identify and qualify the benefits that the program stakeholders want us to realize, okay? How do we do that and analyze the business strategy, the internal and external, who are the influences and influencers, what are the program drivers? And quite frankly, the output you're looking for there is the program steering committee produces that program charter, the strategic objectives and the desired benefits and the benefits register. Oh, wait a second, where do we see that program charter? One of the, one of the uh, outputs of the first phase of uh, program definition, right? And then in the sub phase of planning, we would update that program charter. So we've got a neat and tidy plan to help us start from, right? That analysis and planning then, we help, uh, it helps us establish the program benefits management plan, okay? That helps us codify those elements, okay? And the outputs are that plan. And we've got these defined and prioritized program components a la projects or sub programs. And then we understand their interdependencies. Are these two completely inter, de, independent? Can I do both of them at the same time? Or do I have to finish this one with its outcome or output and they act as the outputs from one act as the inputs for another? Or do I need to do these two before I do this third or fourth one? And finally, uh, in our, our next two sections, we look at the delivery. Well, what's the purpose of delivery? We gotta deliver the expected benefits. That's why the executives and the folks in the C-suite are looking to us. We want to increase market share. We want to be able to roll that new phone out. We want to be able to produce that new thing or achieve that end state. Okay, so talk to me about how we're, we are realizing the elements in the benefits management plan. Okay, we've got a little bit of an iterative process there. All right, and then in the delivery of the activities, okay, we've got, we got a pack of horses. They're running, they're running together and we're gonna monitor the environment. We're gonna look at the program objectives and the benefits. We're gonna compare those two. We're gonna initiate and perform transition and close the components here, right? So those projects, we're gonna evaluate our opportunities and the threats and our key performance indicators against those, right? And we're gonna record the progress in the benefits program register. Why do we wanna record the progress in the program benefits register? Who's played sports before, right? What do you guys do when you play sports? You guys keep score? Keep score. You're right. It, it lets you know wh where are we at. Our goal was to, to get the ball in the net, to score a touchdown, okay, to cross home plate. Recording that in the program benefits register lets us know when we did these things, we achieved these benefits that we were looking for. It helps us with our process improvement so we can uh, deliver those same benefits, maybe more efficiently and more effectively than the last time, or inform our decision maker next time, 
hey, it took this amount of resources to get those benefits. Did that really move the needle on us? Yes or no? Is that really worth our time? Okay, how do we do that, right? We achieve those benefits, like, like I talked about a second ago, second ago, either through individual project outcomes or collectives, collective project outcomes and outputs. We measure those against the business case and the return on the investment and the payback periods, market share as example that we've used shareholder price and the unit cost for production. Do we get better at producing this, more efficient or more effective? Now, if any of you have picked up the uh, the program management, uh, they're the standard for program management fourth edition. You may, you may have recognized this, this slide. If we've got cost over time, you know, we could look at cost is going to go up, right? Uh, and we apply more and more resources to our effort from, you know, down here pretty low during definition and it rises and then it peaks here during program delivery. And then as we're achieving more and more projects and closing them out, right? And all of our projects are closed out by year and, and we're still expending some resources to close out the program. Well, we start, we don't, we start seeing realization of the benefits here during program delivery, right? And as we're executing right here in this middle section, as we're executing the projects and that just continues to go up and then the streams cross. Okay, for, for our Ghostbuster fans, okay, the, the delivery benefits increase at, even as the expenditures decrease, and then it continues afterwards. So we are in a position where we continue to reap benefits even after we have gotten to a point where we have stopped, right, because this line goes here and goes to zero, we have stopped uh, using project and program resources against that. We're getting we're getting delivered. Anybody have an idea what some of those benefits, an example of some of those benefits could look like or could be, or that you all might have experienced in the past? How about brand? Right? After you're done with your marketing efforts and producing, and you've got the new Ford Mustang out and everybody is really happy with it, having you solidified, you know, Ford has solidified itself as uh, a key manufacturer of a really cool two-door car, right? Okay, benefits transition then, the idea is that we're gonna turn this over so we can sustain it. Here's, here's uh, Bobby, where your, your effort come, your, your, your question before it turns in, gotta have in the benefits management plan, who is taking over what so we can, who's getting this thing, right? These resources and these elements, and then how are we gonna sustain those benefits afterwards? Okay, stakeholder engage, engagement, okay. How do you, can you really manage an apex predator? I, I can't, right? Now, current thought, thought process is, hey, you've got a quad chart, okay? Support on one axis, influence on the other, right? Low support to high support uh, or, or negative support to positive. And then the same thing for influence, okay? I'd submit to you that my life is kind of turned into this and, and you've got a fence. And on one side, you know, in the, right in the center is neutral, okay? And uh, instead of a, a quad chart like this, what you've got is a spectrum on both sides where you've got low power, okay, to, uh, uh, or sorry, low support to high support and low power to high power, Okay, and your idea is that if you have folks that are low support, high power, you wanna try and pull them, okay, towards your fence or maybe onto your side, okay? These folks who are low power, uh, low support, they're going to try and influence everybody else to move this way, okay, to, sorry, I'm, I'm drawing on the wrong screen. Um, the, uh, the low power, low support folks, they're gonna try and pull people to the left, okay? you've got to engage your high support, low, low power, high support people to do the same thing. Try to convince these folks to move at least to neutral, if not to your side of the, of the fence, right? And then especially over here for your highest power folks. And then you've got to understand what their goals and wants, how they want to be engaged through the communication management process and your communication management plan um, and, and what really how and what ticks them over, right, from an engine standpoint, and, and keep them right where they're at. 
Okay, those are your sponsors and other champions. Uh, any, what do you guys think about the spectrum and fence concept versus the quad chart? Lori, what runs through your mind there in central Illinois today? Um, I like it as a way to think about um, moving them through the spectrum uh, rather than, you know, like a big move. It You can see some progress uh, right, right. In, in little pieces. Yeah, yeah. And guess what? Like, you, it could be a win just to get them to neutral, right? Just to get them to stop slicing you by a thousand cuts, okay? And, and you just get them to, to not do something. I don't need you to come to the public meeting and say, I'm the greatest thing since the bread slicer. But man, you stop blowing me up on social media. I'll take that. That's a win. Thank you, Tanasha. Greatly appreciate that. Uh, Bobby, some more great comments. Yeah. Um, okay. So I talked about people, processes, and tools, right? They're in a reaction. And it helps tie the program governance and the stakeholder engagements together, right? Well, who are people? Well, people aren't, it's, it's the staff, but it's also the delegated and specific responsibilities and the organization, right? So I sit as a senior director of engineering operations in my current position, okay, with CBRE. But I sit within the engineering operations arena. Another, my battle buddy is my counterpart in facility management and he oversees facility management. My other battle buddy to my left of me, she oversees project management and she's got clear responsibilities and the project management team has responsibilities as an organization. Okay. One of the things I learned through going through the, uh, um, uh, the Lean Six Sigma Black Belt course, right, from a process standpoint, if, if you're thinking of end-to-end -end processes, okay, you've got process steps. Lay out those process steps. And each one of those steps as a supplier, somebody's providing something and providing an input. And each one of those nodes has an output and a customer that wants that. And then you chain those things together and it can help you see right, uh, or, or help you visualize what some of the stakeholders are interested in, right? Then you tie all those pieces together. Now, I appreciate everybody hanging in with me. I'm going to go a little bit over, but here's the meat and potatoes here, right? Putting it all together. How we turn that herd of horses, okay, into some, uh, into some domesticated animals that we can use on the ranch, if you will, uh, to get some good work done. Okay, well, I'm going to give you some examples from my own particular uh, experience and the benefits and stakeholder interaction. Uh, I was stationed in, in Afghanistan in the mid 2000s. It was my second tour there. I was working for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers on an important program called the police on a, they're called the police station program to help uh, help deliver the infrastructure for uh, for some uh, governance, uh, internal governance, right, and rule of law establishment that that nation had not seen since the mid-1970s. Uh, it was a design and construction program. We had strategic objectives to help build a design and construction capacity within Afghanistan uh, that hadn't existed for 20 years, okay, more than that. Um, uh, there was also the, uh, like I said, to, we had the desire to build some internal security as a nation and as a coalition, but there were also some operational and tactical objectives. Hey, this money is only good for a year and it has to be expended by the end of the year. We've got to do, we've got to do contract awards by the end of the year and the, and the ongoing contracts had specific due dates. So get it done. Oh, by the way, in a place where most of the uh, raw materials had to get flown in, okay? Challenging effort. So, that's what our piece looked like. I was responsible for 18 geographically spread projects uh, across a significant portion of the country. We could not easily shift resources between the two. We had multiple stakeholders between Afghanistan and the US, between Virginia and Florida. We, I had a key leader, my boss departed um, and he turned authority over to me. And three project crews were threatened on my 10th day, said, if you come back here, uh, you're gonna be killed. We know what you're building, um, and and that by I was already focused, but uh, that put a razor's edge on the focus of how we were going to do this, because we couldn't just flop everything on these Afghani contractors and tell them, "Well, you've got to secure yourself." 
they would immediately implode and all 18 of these projects would have failed. We'd have had strategic and operational failure, okay, to that end. So we looked at what does the contract say? What were the programmatic objectives? What was the strategic objectives and the programmatic objectives? And then we had, we had a, uh, quite frankly, within the program, we had 18 projects that were underneath one task order, 18 separate projects, one program. Um, what are our operating procedures and what makes sense? Okay, where do we need to ask for a deviation from our standard operating procedures? We engaged our sponsors frequently. That day I went over to talk to their sponsors and say, this is our first report. The first report's always wrong. The second report's never right, but the initial report from the field is this. Based on the contract, we could force them to do this. The likelihood that they would succeed, a la my risk assessment, is this, which was very low. I think that we should do this. Um, they bought off on that. Uh, we, we planned and developed, what I really just talked to quickly is we planned and developed some options. We used a decision-making model. What's that? Governance. Okay, we reallocated some people from, from the sites that were at risk, physically at risk, uh, to some other sites so we could maintain progress there while we established uh, some security uh, and improve the security situation so later on we could mass our efforts back at, at the other three, right? And then we looked at how do we recover the schedule and the budget, right? How do we minimize those impacts? Uh, any questions? I know I went through this stuff quick. Any, what, what questions do we have on this example of how we, you can look at the intersection of benefits and stakeholder management? Uh, on any group, there are people that will be against any change. That's a great point, even if minimal from their part. Okay, um, from a little bit later in my career, more recently, uh, here we have, especially for our, our colleagues and friends, and thank you so much. I neglected to, to welcome our, our colleagues from, from Los Angeles. Uh, but here we have the Midwest, the Great Lakes, and this, this area is Chicago, okay? Uh, and sorry, this area is Chicago. I keep doing my telestrator on the wrong screen. Um, third largest metropolitan area in the Midwest uh, sits on the Great Lakes, which is the largest single available freshwater supply in the world. Available freshwater supply. Folks have said, what about the Arctic? Well, can you drink ice? You can't, that, that means it's not available. So here we had in the early 1980s, and Chicago was formed right in the early 1880s, went through exponential growth, literally the entire century of the 1880s. Uh, and, and that included the, the delivery of water and sewage infrastructure that that was modern in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, but the, comp the area was less than 1 million then and is something like 6.8 or 7.2 million now between the urban sprawl of Northwestern Indiana up to the Milwaukee border. I'm sorry, the, Wisconsin, the Illinois Wisconsin border heading up to towards Milwaukee. Can't handle it, right? Massive flooding happened throughout Chicagoland during that time frame. Multiple local governments and communities were involved and were stakeholders and how do we tame that stallion? Well, so zooming in, okay, to the city of Chicago, all right, my hometown, we've got, uh, we, they developed the Tunnel and Reservoir Plan, TARP. And, and this uh, graphic on the right-hand side shows the general borders of the city, okay, uh, along with, um, yeah, the general borders of the actual city of Chicago and 109 miles of tunnels, and I tell a lie, this is Cook County. This isn't the city of Chicago, this is, this is Cook County itself. Uh, what they did was they developed uh, a plan uh, of 109 miles of deep tunnel. The tunnels are one mile underneath the ground and three different reservoirs located that can take water in from three different sets of the tunnels. Uh, across 100, sorry, across 10 congressional districts in 101 communities, right? You've got the city of Chicago proper and then all of the collar communities uh, like Evergreen Park and Marionette Park, et cetera, et cetera. These folks here out here in Whiting uh, and, and East Chicago and Chicago, uh, right there in Indiana. And I grew up right about, yeah, south of Calumet City, right, right south of a river that used to flood 
My parents' house flooded twice. President Reagan declared that area a national disaster area in the early 1980s. And then it flooded again two years later. So they got hot on this and they said, okay, look, uh, they being the Army Corps of Engineers, the local congressmen, uh, and other, uh, other constituents like the uh, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, they said, look, what would it take for us to alleviate the flooding over this entire area, right? Uh, or some of the flooding over this entire area. And they looked on with the return on the investment, okay? They looked at over, since this is a civil works project, uh, the United States government's plans are to um, invest sequentially over time in efforts. They're not done all at once, okay, in, in these pieces here. And, and how long would it take us to get there? As you know, the longer your schedule is, the more potential there is for schedule variance or schedule growth, okay? Uh, the longer you're going to execute multiple projects and your project complexity and your program complexity, therefore, will increase the potential for cost variance. And then what does stakeholder satisfaction look like? And I can tell you from somebody that, that lived through that as a young boy and then lived through uh, disaster response as a young man and a middle-aged man providing it, it is significantly emo is a significant emotional event when you have people that have suffered uh, natural disasters, especially flooding. Right? You said, what does the stakeholder satisfaction look like? Because that's a key, uh, a key metric for the US Army Corps of Engineers um, and how they're evaluated each year. So what did that look like? Well, it manifested itself. Here's an example of the, uh, of the McCook uh, Reservoir that will hold, uh, and sorry about this, that's a misplaced, uh, misplaced graphic. Um, this will hold 10 billion gallons when it's complete. It's already online. The first 3.1 billion gallons is already online. It will hold 10 billion gallons of sewage that otherwise would have pushed up into people's basements uh, through the, the current um, and the improved uh, sewer, combined sewer uh, and, and rainwater system that's, that's ongoing. And then it will gravity feed to one of several wastewater treatment plants, that sewage will get treated and then it will be released back into the water supply. Uh, so one of uh, a fantastic example of, of green meets good, right? And, and our, our purpose there was to talk about, you know, the intersection of stakeholders, the intersection of potential solution sets. Uh, what questions do we have here? I don't see any. We can try to wrap up. And, okay, great. Um... One last one, one last example. So uh, KPMG needed to train itself. Uh, it decided to stop renting space. It built a 52-acre, $450 million campus. And they said, hey, look, we've got to tie the benefits to the governance intersection. A lot of people wanted to make sure that they were involved in decision making. And because it's a, a, uh, a for-profit organization um, that is owned by partners, uh, we were scrutinized pretty heavily on every investment we made. And the objectives there were to deliver the state of art learning facility, which then trained our folks on how to do their jobs. And then we could turn those folks loose on projects and, and gain revenue, but also to integrate the technology, the staff, this new facility and the processes to be more efficient and more effective in the delivery of our training. Um, so not a pretty light read on that one. I apologize for that, but uh, I appreciate you, you all for participating, for dialing in. Look, I got ambushed by a kidney stone uh, the night before I was supposed to go the last time. And, and I can't thank you enough for you being patient and, and, and rescheduling. So thank you very much, uh, Florence, uh, for, for doing that and for all of you for, for dialing in. Uh, if you please, if you scroll all the way up, you'll see my, uh, my contact information. I've got it here too. And, and I'd love to, to answer any questions that you have now or in the future. Lots of thank yous. Yep, thank you. Yeah, this was great, Kevin. You more than enough, you know, gave us um, a lot of um, ideas, and and you had my my mind going as you were talking. So I you. appreciate you. And judging based on the comments, I think everyone feels the same. It was informative. Lots of thank you. Yep, great, great, great. So we are. 
five minutes past seven, so we apologize for being over time, but it was for a good cause as far as I'm concerned. We, Central Illinois, invite you all to our April event on April 11th. It's a lunch and learn. If you can make it, the LA folks, I'm not sure, um, but we have other things coming up in May, June, July, so please um, definitely keep us in mind as far as um, topics and, and presentations. Um, we can just stop here. And Bobby, thank you for connecting me with Kevin because you made this event possible. So I have to give you your due credit. Um, anything else? Yeah, looks like we're all good. So we can just stop here. I will stop recording. I will send the survey to my Central Illinois folks with the slide. And then the um, David will send you the LA uh, folks David will send you the um, the PDF document, and uh, we'll just handle it that way. Yeah, we're, we're good. No other questions, it looks like. We're all good. Well, have a great evening. Enjoy your week, your weekend. Have a great one, everybody. Bye, Kevin. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.